Have you ever been around a leader by just being in their presence inspires a belief that you didn't have before? Great leaders have the ability to transfer belief onto the people they have the privilege to lead. So we look at all high performers, they have a strong conviction, a strong belief that they can do hard things, they can overcome obstacles, that they can accomplish great things. Belief is such a powerful thing. There is nothing more powerful than belief. So I want to start off with a question with you. Have you ever had a leader in your life or someone in your life that has done just that, has inspired belief into you? It's a great question because I go back growing up, sports were everything to me, my cousins, and it was baseball, basketball, football were the primary drivers. And I can remember my middle school years, I was playing all of those. And all of a sudden this guy showed up who ended up being the cross country coach for our local high school. And his name was Thane Jones. And I'll never forget, I saw Thane the first time and he had brought up something about running cross country. And my immediate response was, absolutely not. <laughs> like, there is no way I'm wearing those short shorts. There is no way I'm going to run for fun. Um, and there was no way I was going to do it. And he just said, just come out once. Just come out to one of our summer trainings. And I went to that one event and my life was changed ever since because I got to that event and noticed something right away that there was different about him, that he had the ability to transfer belief. Because instantly I learned quickly he was one of the most competitive people, that there was a fire inside of him that was different. And I think when you talk about leaders that transfer belief, the people that they're leading, they don't just want what they're saying, they want to be more like them. And so when I was that eighth grade, going to be a freshman, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know much about cross country other than I wanted that fire that he had. And so long behold, he transferred that belief enough to where I was in those short shorts that <laughs> next ball out there training with the team, running miles on end and absolutely fell in love with it because of uh, his impact on me and that ability to transfer belief. And so when I think about it, that's where my mind goes uh, to someone that transfer belief. That's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. And then when you think back, okay, that was back in high school, wearing short shorts. What does that mean now to you as you know, a businessman, a high performer, as a father, as a husband? When you think about your life and you look back to your coach, what did that do for you now? It's a great question. I think on those journeys that you just shared, starting and running a business, um, ha have been the leader of a family, co-leader, of a family is you're going to get moments where belief feels like it runs out mm. in different ca capacities. And what that showed me is that I can do hard things because hard things are coming. They're inevitable, but there's that unwavering conviction inside that when they show up, because again, they will, I can do hard things. And so when that belief runs out, maybe for a temporary time, it's the belief that I can do the things to stack up the evidence to show me where to get that belief back and drive better results. So that's what I go back to. And I go back to those moments all the time of because I did that, because I did those one mile repeats that pushed me physically to my limits, I can surely go up and stand in front of an audience and deliver a speech or do a training session. So my question to you is, you've been spending a lot of time with really high performers, some of which are in the NFL where have you seen in the NFL specifically this power of belief with athletes and coaches at that high of a level? Yeah, a lot of people are, are, are looking for this thing called confidence, right? And I love how you just said how belief can run out because it happens to everybody. And sometimes we look at some of these people that are in the NFL or that are CEOs and, and you think that they never run out of belief, but it happens to the best of them. So at the time of this conversation right now, the Miami Dolphins have one of the most explosive offenses, right? And they're led by their quarterback, Tua. But if you look back a couple of years ago, Tua was really struggling, both on the field and kind of in between his own ears, in the dark, so to speak. And he was even looking at himself in the mirror, asking himself every day, do I suck? Now, if you think about that, Here's one of 32 people in the world can do what he's doing. And by the way, what college did he go to? Uh, Alabama. And he was, you know, a prolific quarterback there. So he had all of this evidence to show him that he was great. But yet he was asking himself every single day, do I suck? And then 
he got blessed with a new leader in his life, a new head coach, Mike McDaniels. And one of the first things Mike McDaniels did is he put together a 700-play highlight film to show Tua that he didn't suck. In fact, he was great. And Tua's performance turned the corner, skyrocketed. Ended up the, that year being the leading point get, vote getter for the Pro Bowl. Huh. And what it took was someone else believing in him. And if you think about it again, here's somebody that's one of the best at what he does, and his belief was running out. It took someone else to show him and believe in him so that he could believe in himself. And then all of a sudden that belief turned into behaviors, which then produced results. That's really good. And and I guess the, the cool part is, is like going back to that story real quick is we all have these limiting beliefs, right? And we have a firm belief that no one will ever outperform their own belief system, both individu individually and collectively as teams. So Lucas has got a really cool short story of talking about how to kind of unlock, so to speak, some of those limiting beliefs. Yeah, I think it's a great segue because even performers like Tua have what we call the little person voice. And that little person voice is an inner critic. Sometimes the highest performers, they are the highest critics on themselves. And what we know is that in order for them to be at their best, we got to help them rise above it. And so if you take a grasshopper, if you finally catch one and hold it inside your hands, you might feel it trying to jump all around. And you get it inside of a jar and put the cover on. For a little bit, that grasshopper is going to jump all over the place trying to escape, trying to get out, it's jumping all around. But after it realizes there's a lid on it, it doesn't jump any longer. And it'll just stay on the bottom of that jar to the point where you can take the lid off and that grasshopper stays right in the jar because it learned what's the point. Why even try? Because there's no way that I can get out. And so what we believe is a lot of times that little person voice inside of us, it operates as that lid capping our potential and sometimes what it takes is somebody else to step into our life, kind of like McDaniels did for, for Tua, to take that lid off and then believe in us even before we believe in ourselves so that we can jump higher and outside of that jar. And so with high performance and with leadership, we view it as one of the most important things when transferring belief is how do you help that person overcome their own limiting beliefs to be their best? Mm. And so... It's also a good transition into uh, at a recent keynote that I heard you give. You shared an amazing story of then how belief drives behavior. That the stronger the belief, the stronger the consistent behavior can be. Will you go and share that with everyone? Yeah. So there, there was a young man that grew up uh, on the western side of the United States in California. And unfortunately, he grew up in, in a broken home. So his father was in prison. His mother was an addict, I believe, but so, so it was struggling and he grew up seeing all this. That was his environment. And so what do you think he believed? Well, probably that he was heading down the same path. And those beliefs then drove his behavior. So his behaviors kind of reflected that. Started hanging out with the wrong people, started getting involved with drugs and alcohol, stopped going to class, stopped going to school altogether. So his mother uh, obviously loved him and tried to get him back on, on, on a good path and asked him to do one, one favor, one promise, and that was to take the SAT. So on, on the West Coast, that's kind of the standardized test. And the best you can do is a 1600. And so he loves his mother, so he follows through on that promise. He takes it. Months later, he gets the results in the, in the mail, and he opens up his letter, and he's reading through it. He gets towards the bottom, and in bold is a score. He looks at his score, and he scores a 1470 out of 1600. Now, over a thousand, you're pretty smart. 1470, it's almost perfect. You're brilliant. So he's all excited. He takes a letter, he runs over to his mom. His mom looks at the letter, looks at the score, looks at him, looks at the score, looks at him. And then the first thing out of her mouth was, Did you cheat? He said, No, Bob, I tried to cheat, but I couldn't. The way they situated the desks and the chairs, I couldn't see anybody else's test. I, I tried, but I couldn't cheat. And she said, The next thing out of her mouth was, Oh my gosh, you're smart. Now, hearing that from his mom meant a lot. And then the score gave him evidence. So he started to believe, I am smart. And so what he started to do, he changed his behavior. He started going to school, started hanging out, stopped hanging out with those people, started doing the right thing. Now, also word caught wind to his teachers. They started coming up to him and saying, oh my gosh, you were smart all along. All you had to do was apply yourself. Huh. Now he had dug himself such a hole that he couldn't get into college, but he could get into a junior college. Did well at that junior college, got into Kent State University, graduated from Kent State University, and became a successful magazine entrepreneur. Ended up getting married and having two kids, had a great life. 
Years later, he gets another letter in the mail from the SAT. This one reads, we regret to inform you, but every year we do a random audit. And the year that you took it, you were one of five people that got the wrong score. You actually got a 740, not a 1470. So a lot of people hear that story. They think, oh my gosh, the score changed his life. Well, the score didn't necessarily change his life. His belief changed his life because his beliefs drove his behaviors. And we also love to get down to the root of things, right? And a lot of people will focus on the fruit, people's behaviors. But until you get down to the root, their beliefs, it's hard to change the behaviors. So we just love that story because it's just a great representation of when you can change someone's belief system, when you can inspire belief in them, the sky's the limit. And their behaviors can change, and then the results have a chance of changing as well. I love that. And such a powerful story to show the power of belief. And a question that I have for you, people listening might have leader of a team or a business that they're like, man, I understand the power of belief, but we're in a tough spot. Mm -hmm. You know, we're on a negative spiral, or maybe we're up against an opponent and we're not picked to win. Odds are against us right now. Belief is low. When you found yourself in that spot in the past, maybe against an opponent that on paper was more talented, the odds were saying they should beat you. How did you transfer that belief to your team? It's a great question. And I don't think there's like a magic potion. Like if you just do this one thing, it's going to work. But one thing that we really uh, focused on was our culture, right? And we talked a lot of that connected teams are powerful teams. And I think great teams are always greater than the sum of our parts. So a lot of times it's easy to look at all the reasons why you cannot be effective or why you can't win or they have better players or whatever their excuses might be that you can get drawn to. But one thing we always focused on was our team and how our team, if we stuck together, we were always greater than the sum of our parts. We also always focused on our process. And we got our players to believe, and rightfully so, that the way we trained was a separator. So maybe what we saw on the outside, we were maybe intimidated by because they had these players or, or this type of advantage, but we always came back to our training. And I would also say a lot of times it's not always what you say, but it's how you say it. When you speak with conviction, it is amazing how that can transfer belief. If they believe in you as a leader, they will believe in what you have to say. So a lot of times that we get caught up on what, we, what we're going to say, but to me, it's just as powerful in how we say it. I love that. And it's crucial for anybody that's listening because belief is what's the likelihood that the thing we're talking about is going to happen. Mm. And if you can look at your past and you have a stack of undeniable proof that you do hard things, that we've trained harder and better, our process is stronger, and we ha truly have that connected team, it's hard not to get belief. And so as a wrap, what we would want to close down with is this. The power of belief is crucial as we build strong teams, but it starts with you as the leader. Can you first lead yourself to cultivate that belief so when people are around you, they feel it? And then can you help inspire that belief in others so that they can go out and be their best?